There's uh, vividness, uh, graphic details, uh, really interesting uh, way Mark records things. He picks up these little details that really make his story come alive. And so, for example, in the uh, Matthew, you've got in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus goes out and he's tempted of Satan. And so you've got Satan turn these stones to bread, and Jesus says, you know, quoting Deuteronomy, chapters 4 to chapter 8 there, a man does not live by bread alone. He takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down, because Scripture says his angels will bear you up. Jesus says, you don't tempt the Lord your God. And then he takes him up to the mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus, again, responds from Deuteronomy. And, and so you get this Old Testament, Satan attacking Jesus, and Jesus responding from the book of Deuteronomy. In Mark, you, uh, it's very different. Um, and Mark has these punchy little things. So in Mark, he says, Jesus went out into the desert, and he was among the wild animals. And so you say, where did these wild animals come from? But Mark picks up this fact that Jesus is out in the desert with the wild animals. And so it's, uh, it's interesting. Chapter, that's in chapter 1, verse 13. Chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, Jesus casts the demon out. And it says, normally Jesus just, you know, boom, casts the demon out, and the demon goes out. Mark picks up the fact, and the Spirit came out with a shriek. And so you get this kind of extra little with a shriek kind of thing. So Mark has these kind of graphic, enlivening details uh, that are found there and things. And it's just this kind of interesting there uh, with this. Now, one other thing I should point out, um, Mark in chapter 3, verse 5. Let me just read this for you, too. It's kind of interesting. And I think um, as Jesus is portrayed there in an interesting way, and, and it describes what's going on inside of Jesus. And so in chapter 3, uh, verse 5, uh, Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath? Remember, they were getting on Jesus about the Sabbath. Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or kill? But they remained silent. They would not answer him. This was the man with the shriveled hand. So this guy comes up to Jesus. He's got a shriveled hand. And the, these people want to see, the Pharisees are looking at him saying, will he heal this guy with the shriveled hand on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, which is lawful than the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? They do not respond. They remain silent. And then it says this concerning Jesus. He looked around at them in anger. And I think it's just, it's really interesting to me. Mark picks up the fact that they are silent Jesus asked him, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? They're bad. And they, won't, they won't answer his question. And Jesus, as he looked at him, he looked at them in anger. And I think a lot of times in our culture, we really have a problem with this anger thing. And somebody jumps in and says, wait a minute, back in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't Jesus say if a person was angry his brother without a cause, you committed murder in his heart? Here we see Jesus angry. And Mark says explicitly, Jesus was angry. So you've got to be very careful. And a lot of you have had me for Old Testament, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, is God angry several times? The ground opens up and swallows all, you know, Korah, Dathan, Abiram, all these people. And God's anger comes out and, and fiery serpents come out on uh, the people and things. And so in the Old Testament, you see God's anger a lot. And a lot of people blow that off and just say, basically, that's the Old Testament. Uh, you know, and Jesus is lovey-dovey. Jesus is kind, the kind, compassionate Jesus and things. But here you've got, and he looked around at them and angry and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely res restored. Then the Pharisees, now what's the, they're the opponents. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And that's in Mark chapter 3, very early here, after he heals the guy with the shriveled hand. So Mark picks up these, these inner details of Jesus, that Jesus was angry with them. And I just want to say that I think there's a point for anger. And I think in our culture, we've gone so flatline. Anything that's angry, uh, we, we, we label it as extreme or some sort of derogatory term. But there, there's a point, there's a time in which someone should be angry. And when, if you don't get angry, something's wrong. And so here we see even Jesus gets angry. And so you've got to be very careful about this, as trying to eliminate all anger. No, there's a time for anger. There's a time not. And Jesus was angry here. So this is Jesus. We're Christians. We follow Jesus. Jesus was angry at their stubborn hearts. And it seems to me that that sets a model for us as well. So, graphic details. Mark picks up that kind of thing. Here's his favorite word. This is a Greek term, kind of brought over into English, uh, euthus. 
Euthus, for my Greek students, will recognize the word means immediately. Mark uses this term euthus 42 times in his book. I give you a couple references there. Chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 5, verse 42, etc., etc. And so Mark uses this word a lot um, immediately. Now what happens then when you use this uh, word over and over again immediately is that it has the sense that the narrative is moving on quickly. And this immediately happened, and then that immediately happened, and things are moving quickly. And so you get this, uh, it's one of Mark's favorite words, 42 times he uses it and things. So the, Mark is an action book, I guess that's what it would tell us. Mark is an action book. He also uses the present tense a lot, while Matthew will use uh, more the uh, past tense and things, the aorist tense. Um, and I, you've got a big debate on Greek tenses, and I don't want to get into all that. But Mark does use the present tense a lot. And so that basically fronts things to you, and basically the present tense fronts thing, and Mark is doing this immediately, immediately, present tense, present tense, present tense, and it makes things more vivid, more uh, actionful, and so you get this kind of thing going with Jesus, or with the book of Mark. So that's uh, just some Mark kind of characteristic details. Um, now, realism. The dullness of the disciples. The disciples not really understanding. And so Mark picks up on this, this character portrayals. Uh, they didn't really understand the parables and things. At the death of Jesus, is describing his own death. Peter does not understand that Jesus is going to die. So Peter rebukes Jesus. And then he said to them in chapter 9, verse 32, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after three days he will rise. They're going to kill him, but after three days, this is Jesus describing his own death. And it says, but they did not understand what he meant. And they were afraid. Did you get that notion of fear coming up again? Okay. They did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. And so Jesus says, oh, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. And they're all like, whoa, this is off limits. It's like, you know, you don't go to a party. You want to have fun at a party, go to people, go to a party and tell them, I'm going to die. Yeah, and I'm going to raise again from the dead. Well, when you talk about death at a party, things like that with people, everything goes quiet. And so the disciples here, it says, they did not understand what he meant. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Okay? And at other points, the disciples even criticized him. Um, the disciples are, are, are repeatedly criticized by Jesus when they play the role of gatekeeper. And the disciples kind of allowing who gets to Jesus and who doesn't get to Jesus. And basically, especially with little children coming to Jesus. And the disciples are kind of like pushing the little kids back. And Jesus, you know, the little children are such as the kingdom are, are such as these. And so Jesus uh, has some rebuke for his disciples and things. They didn't really understand him. And so Mark picks up on this fact that the disciples... And by the way, uh, it's kind of interesting here. You've got here are the leaders of the Christian church... Jesus is, you know, the Son of God coming down, dies, resurrects, and things like that. And these are the 12 apostles that he chose, okay? The 11 Judas perishing uh, for his betrayal and things. And then chapter Acts picking the 12th disciple and the apostle Paul becoming an apostle. And they send out then, they send out the 12. Um, but it's interesting here, when they're the gatekeepers, Jesus rebukes them and says, basically, let the little children come unto me and things. And so the disciples do not kind of understand Jesus very well. And not only does, does Jesus' disciples not understand, but um, and let me just do this one from here. Um, his own family, his own family comes at him, and Mark picks this up. Basically, his own family came to him in chapter 3, verse 21. And his own family members, we're talking about Mary and his brothers and sisters, and with James and Joseph, and it lists some of the names of the people we know from other passages. And it says, basically, they came to take control of him because they said he's out of his mind. And so this is Jesus' family members, and apparently his fam even his own mother and his family, brothers and sisters, did not understand him. And they come and think that he's out of his mind. Let me just read that, 321, Mark 321. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Remember, the teachers of the law said, he's, he's a Beelzebub, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. And so his own family did not understand him, his disciples did not understand him, Mark picks this up, and apparently the disciples were afraid to ask him, and so you get this fear thing coming up again as well. 
It's only in the book of Mark when, when you say, in most of the Gospels, you'll say Jesus was the son of Joseph the carpenter. And so usually it lists Joseph as the carpenter. So Jesus is the son of Joseph, who is a carpenter. In the book of Mark, Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, only here, Jesus himself was called the carpenter. Is not this the carpenter? So in Mark, he picks up the fact that Jesus himself was labeled as a carpenter. Um, so probably studying their father and son. Well, I say in, in our culture, you say, well, carpenters make really good money in things. But back then, we know from other things that Jesus was from a very poor family. And apparently there weren't union wages back then. So anyways, Jesus was called the carpenter. Another major theme that Mark brings up here and that we've talked about before is this emphasis on suffering. Mark picks up on the notion of the suffering servant. That's going to be, as Matthew Christ was king in the book of Mark, Mark will be uh, Jesus as the suffering servant. Uh, 833, 933, and 1033, that's kind of how I remember them. Actually, 1031. 831, 931, and 1031, kind of in that passage, is those where Mark describes and the suffering of Jesus described in chapters 8, 9, and 10. So Mark's going to